let me read to you a passage from the first chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 12 to 15. It's the Gospel for the first Sunday of Lent in year B. St. Mark writes, At once the Spirit sent Jesus out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. That's from Mark chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. And what does it suggest to us? Well, it scarcely needs to be said that the life of man is one of struggle against temptation. That is to say, temptations keep coming and the battle does not end with one victory, nor with one defeat. Let us observe in passing, though, that there is something to be said for being in this condition rather than, say, having one's entire destiny hang on the balance of one single test or trial. It is agreed that the angels determine <coughs> their destiny <coughs> by one great choice. They see all there is to be seen in the issue ahead, and they choose for or against God accordingly. With fallen man, the case is different. However, that matter aside, let us just contemplate with wonder the abasement of God the Son assuming the state and condition of man and permitting himself to be tempted to sin. <clears throat> of course, his temptations to sin did not arise from a fallen and disordered human nature, what we call the flesh. They arose from the other two great sources, the world and the devil. On one occasion, after Simon Peter had given his magnificent profession of faith in our Lord as Messiah and Son of God, he attempted to dissuade our Lord from the path of suffering and death. It was a temptation coming from outside of our Lord not to obey the will of his Heavenly Father. And our Lord immediately indicated its source. <clears throat> in full view of his disciples, he sternly rebuked Peter, addressing him as Satan. He said that the way he thought was of man and not of God. So, Peter was thinking as did the world, and Satan was actively behind it. And there were many other temptations bearing down on the sinless Christ. There was the pressure of the leaders of the people. There were the people themselves who pressured to make him a king. There were those who abandoned him because of his teaching on the Eucharist. They said it was too hard a saying. Behind all these pressures, temptations we might call them, was the baleful pressure of Satan. Christ, of course, was resolute in his unconquerable sinlessness, but it all illustrates that being fully man, he assumed our state and condition, including the condition of being tempted. And some of those temptations were great temptations. Especially noteworthy is one temptation which is recorded as having come directly from Satan. Our Gospel passage today from Mark it narrates that as soon as Christ received the Holy Spirit at his baptism by John, the Holy Spirit sent him into the desert where he was tempted by Satan. Now the Gospel of St. Matthew gives us much more detail about the temptations in the desert. Satan actually attempted to get Christ to turn from the worship of the one only God, his Heavenly Father, and to worship him. <clears throat> the promise, the carrot at the end of the stick we might say, was that he would rule the entire world. No one had done that. Alexander the Great had not, nor had, nor would the Caesars. 
the Gospel of St. Matthew tells us that this was promised to one man, Jesus Christ, and the promise came from Satan himself. Christ did intend to rule the world, but here was a temptation to do it quickly and in a worldly sense. The price was that he worshipped not God but Satan. Christ sent him packing, but it reminds us that Christ shared our condition to the full, with the exception of personal sin. Today's scene of Christ in the desert being tempted by Satan reminds us also of the ultimate implication of every sin. In the final analysis, it involves a turning away from the one God to worship something else. The slightest deliberate venial sin is a slight turn in that direction. The more venial sins that are committed, the more there is confirmed our turn in that direction. Finally, there is the fall into mortal sin. And that is a break with God, the logical result of which is eternal separation from Him. But there are also temptations which correspond directly to the temptation Satan presented to our Lord in the desert. The temptation to turn away from the worship of the one God. There are, for instance, various forms of superstition. There is positive irreligion, atheism and agnosticism. There is polytheism. Of course, in many cases, there is involved, we can only hope, a conviction born of ignorance. But it is a state of great darkness, nevertheless. In God is light, and away from him there is only darkness. That light has come among us and is given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Let us contemplate the person of Jesus Christ, true God and true man, being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, as we heard in the Gospel of today that I read earlier. Just think, the all-holy God-made man is approached by the dark and putrid demon who presumes to suggest to him holding out a great incentive that he abandon the one God and worship another God, himself no less. That is the ultimate issue. Is it to be God? Or is it to be something or someone else instead? That is the daily choice before us. So, let us take our stand with Jesus and never leave his side, never. No matter what be the cost. Christ, yes. Sin, Never.